Hello, I'm Kate Williamson and welcome to Keep It Clean, a podcast from Jangro that talks about the changing face of the cleaning industry. Today we're discussing the fusion of technology and cleaning. How can smart sensors, automation, and yes, of course, AI, revolutionize the way that our spaces are kept pristine? Can this technology provide real value to businesses beyond just cleanliness? For some buildings, having robots running around all over the place is an absolute no-no. For for other places, it's fine. It's it's not Mm -hmm. a problem at all. What technology is allowed is having a data-driven model to understand how a building flows. Understanding how a building works can really help a cleaning contractor determine how best to clean that environment. I'm joined by John Pratton, director at CoreSolve, an IT consultancy company who works to integrate cleaning technology into businesses, and my colleague Ross Osborne, sustainability and innovations director at Jangro. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining me today. John, how is the integration of technology transforming the traditional cleaning industry? I think in a multitude of different ways. So most people will understand the introduction of things like robotic cleaners. So you're seeing that not just at the home level, but in the much larger office level and areas like shopping centres or airports, Mm. things like that. That's changing quite rapidly um, in terms of things like collision detection, knowing the maintenance of the machine, how much it's been used, where it's actually cleaned, those sorts of things. So it's easier to monitor in terms of what a robot is doing in terms of a traditional cleaner. A lot of organisations looking at the moment between do we employ cleaners or do we employ robots to clean certain areas. So that's one element of it. The other one is around things like IoT sensors. So the ability with smart buildings and the integration with things like footfall sensors. For those that don't know, IoT. Can you explain that? Yeah, so it's a technology that's been around for quite a long time, and IoT stands for Internet of Things, but it runs on a technology called LoRaWAN, and it's basically a very low-powered network, and what it means that you can put your own network into any building and have the gateways, which basically consolidate all the information from the sensors, quite a long way from the sensors. You can have very small, low-powered, some of them run off of watch batteries and the very discrete devices around the building, tracking lots of different things, so from humidity, from temperature, uh, things like footfall as well, doors opening and closing, those sorts of things, infrared beams being broken, air quality monitors. There's a whole raft of uh, different technology out there. So I think you're going to see this crossover. It started to happen between other areas of the business. So things like security is a really good example. So certain CCTV cameras and certain uh, security sensors can actually detect footfall. And obviously those areas where there's high volume of traffic, a lot of people using things like washrooms, you want to know where to put your resources. So I think the technology is really starting to look at how you put your resources in the best way into the into the building mm. and make it as efficient as possible. And what you don't want to be doing all of the time is cleaning all of the washrooms in exactly the same way because it might be that, for example, things like disabled toilets get used on a, a one in a hundred yeah, frequency yeah. and using that to drive changes in things like the cleaning schedule. Mm. We've done some really interesting things with one of the big <clears throat> casinos in London, which runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week to actually work out what's the optimum schedule rotor for cleaners yeah. going in, rather than having it exactly the way it was before, you actually monitor how the building's being used. And then I think the next part of it is around things like the environmental aspects of it. Okay. How much water you need to use, how much cleaning product you need to use, and making sure that the right resources go into, into the right place. And then the last part I would say around it is a lot of artificial intelligence, it's not really being applied at the moment, I don't think, but it will be, is going to be applied to collecting all the footfall information, all the washroom information, all the information from the robots in terms of where they've been or where cleaners have been, Mm. and really look at patterns that at the moment we just can't see. 
we're starting to use AI as a technology to understand data and what it's telling us. And some of the stuff you can do with it is absolutely amazing <laughs> and, and scary and equally scary as well. And then, yeah. and then it brings up a whole philosophical conversation about do you want to be employing people or do you want to be employing, employing robots? Yeah. So, But obviously no. all that data that you are collecting is obviously going to give businesses a lot of cost efficiencies that they wouldn't have had. Yeah, if they know which questions to ask. So yeah. a lot of the conversations we have with businesses, what is the question you're trying to ask? So rather than focus on the technology and focus on, oh, we need to get this or we need to get that, it's really about what's the question you want to answer and start with that and then be fairly agnostic about what technology to apply rather than saying, well, they do this and they do that. It's mm. understand what you're trying to solve and understand the quality of cleaning that you want to provide and understand what experience you want to give to people who are using the building. Because for some buildings, having robots running around all over the place is an absolute no-no. For yeah. other places, it's fine. It's, it's not mm. a problem at all. And then you get health and safety issues and all sorts of yeah. uh, all sorts of different things. But yeah. I, think it, I think it's a really interesting point in time you know where we are where there's this crossover between the traditional cleaning Absolutely. industry and what's coming around the corner with the ai sort of revolution as yeah. well <laughs> ross pandemics have without a doubt changed and shaped our history in what ways has the covid pandemic accelerated the adoption of tech in the cleaning industry do you think there's been a number of challenges uh, that covid's presented and i think the other thing we need to dovetail into that is also the Brexit issue um, that we found with migrant workers coming into the UK um, that okay. we had before Brexit. Staff numbers have been difficult and there's been pockets of certain cities in particular that have struggled for employment, probably more regional than cities. And what technology is allowed and some of the areas that John's touched on is IoT and having a data-driven model to understand those workspaces and how a business or a building flows. So how a personnel walks into the reception, do they go straight to the canteen? Do they go to the washroom or do they go straight to their desk? Understanding how a building works can really help a cleaning contractor determine how best to clean that environment. And that pattern grows over a period of weeks and months. And then you start to, to kind of see those averages and it allows the contractor to tailor the environment and tailor the cleaning suitable for the building. So I think, you know, the staffing issues have, have been quite well documented yeah. um, after COVID and, and Brexit. And then you factor in the cobotic aspects. Now, we've seen a trend of trying to put a robot or a cobot into any kind of space to kind of show value, show innovation. Robots and cobots. Uh -huh. Explain that for our listeners. They're essentially the same thing. Robots are what people see as an autonomous machine that will go around their workplace. But the terminology robot kind of speaks as if we're going to be taking cleaners out of the workplace. So a name of Cobot was very quickly adopted so you can work alongside the machine. So a typical example would be a shopping centre. They'd sit on a ride on Scrubber Drive probably for three, four, maybe five hours on a shift, just going up and down, up and down, up and down. It's not the best use of resource. So if you can have a Cobot that works alongside you, that machine can go up and down, up and down, all on its own, all day long, doesn't take a day off. And then the person that operates that machine is working alongside that detailing, doing the edges, doing the corners, changing the bins, cleaning the balustrades, cleaning the glass, all the other bits that another member of the team would do that could be redeployed. If used correctly, you know, they can work quite closely alongside personnel and particularly works well in school environments where it's typically quite difficult to get cleaning staff regionally early in the morning, late at night. So Cobox have played quite a vital role in staff numbers. So yeah, staffing has definitely been quite a challenge for a lot of companies after COVID and technology has definitely played its role there. I think what we've seen with digital learning with COVID has been quite a big step change. Jangro launched Jangro LMS 12 years ago, yeah. um, and quite an early adopter. And it's been probably the last six years that we've seen much more of an explosion of digital learning. Um, and it's allowed people to take on a lot more information in their own time, in their own pace. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you think technology contributes to eco-friendly practices? I guess it depends how we apply technology and eco-friendly clean practices. Are we talking about the products? Are we talking about manufacturing? Um, is it a chemicals? Is it a paper? Is it a machines? That there are so many aspects of it's technology. Broad, isn't it? yeah. It's quite a broad subject. So if we if we look at 
cleaning solutions, for instance, we've seen the next generation of of probiotic cleaners or eco-friendly cleaning where we're taking away petrochemicals, mm. taking away VOCs out of the traditional chemicals that we've always sold in the past. Technology has played its part because we've been able to understand how these products are used in a live environment, whether that's through testing or independent testing houses to understand how a service is kind of cleaned and maintained. In terms of cleaning technology, whether it's cleaning machines, the big innovation that we see in the last couple of years is cobots that we've already kind of spoken about. Yeah. And I think what we'll see in the coming months and years, particularly after ISSA recently, is the form factor of cobotics now getting smaller to work in smaller spaces. Originally, when they came out, they were much more geared towards bigger spaces. So they had a very limited area of the business that they could be worked in. Mm. But now the form factors are getting smaller. They can get into smaller buildings. And I think we'll start to see a steady increase of cobots being rolled out into smaller office spaces. John, we've heard lots about AI. You've already spoken about it. Uh, I mean, AI was introduced to me as a child in the movies, as a very dark presence in our future. I would never have thought that here we are, 2024, and we are living, learning, working alongside it with relative ease. And it is developing at a very quick pace. When you look specifically at cleaning services, how do you think AI is being used to improve them? I think at the moment it's only just really starting. I mean, there's two elements to it, I think, in my mind. One is around the hardware side of things. So there's a lot of really good stuff that's being done around monitoring technology. You can have a video of very Mm. complex concourse and you can understand very quickly the makeup of the people there. So whether it's kids or whether it's adults and which direction they're going in. And if you supplement that with other things like some of the networks that are around in terms of Bluetooth monitoring, those sorts of things, you can get a very quick picture of how a building's being used. And then you can sort of dovetail that with other things like inspections from cleaning managers or supervisors. So they can you can then start to build a model of and a pattern of what's actually going on within a building and a space over time. And you can even get, so some of the stuff that we used to do on Regent Street was look at the seasonal trends in terms of how buildings would be used. So things like slip strips and falls in autumn because it starts to rain. But what you can do is you can then start to have software or you can start to have intelligence that starts to say, well, actually what I am going to do is I'm going to pull the weather source So I know whether it's going to be raining today and I know that the, you know, the volume of slips, trips and falls correlates to that. Mm -hmm. But what I want to do, therefore, is I want to make sure I have cleaners positioned by the entrance to to deal with that. And so there's that, there's some of the sensors can actually detect in washrooms Mm -hmm. whether um, there's water on the surface. So without actually having a presence there, you know, cameras and the hardware can actually detect that there's water on the surface and that a cleaner needs to go and mop that up or, you know, dry the surface. So there's all sorts of things from the hardware side of things. Mm. I think where it's going to end up having its biggest impact is on the analytics of pulling together all of these data sources. And I think that's where the biggest opportunity is. I think we have to be careful with technology and the way that it's going, that it's applied correctly in the right environment. We can't just have technology for technology's sake. I'm all for one for for bringing the right tech to the building. Mm. But we still need to have decision makers on the ground because a live environment is a live environment. And I don't think we'll ever get to the point where there's complete autonomy. The AI side of things doesn't necessarily mean it's accurate. What it does do is it gets you to a potential answer a lot quicker and it it can look at a lot of different things, but you still need the subject matter expert. And I think that that's always a concern with AI that people automatically think at some point it's going to replace people, it's going to take their jobs away. So there is always that little bit of push. You're shaking the head. You're shaking well, the head. I think, there, I think the, well, because I think at the end of the day, certain jobs will be affected by it, yeah. and certain other jobs will be created. And the the conversation is as old as the printing press. You know, before the printing press, there were people, you know, scribbling furiously to to yeah. write Bibles and newspapers and all the rest of it. Printing press came along, and you know, and then the computer came along. And said, well, what are we going to do with newspapers? Yeah. So it all goes digital. And I think that what happens is the world always evolves 
themselves and the workforce has to evolve. It's a mm. new set of tools that people are still trying to get to grips with and still trying to understand. It's evolution at the end of the day, isn't it? It is. And, you know, going back to what Ross said, some of it can be applied really well and some mm. of it can be applied really badly. And just because you've got sensors in washrooms and you might have a AI data analytics engine in the background doesn't actually necessarily mean you're going to get a better answer than having you know a, a traditional cleaning team in place and you know we've yeah. looked at lots of buildings in the past where it's just not it's not fit for purpose it's it's too much um of a sledgehammer to you know crack yeah. a crack a walnut so i think it's horses for courses and certain people who embrace it really massively because that's what they yeah. you know that's what they think <laughs> is the right thing to yeah. do and sometimes it is the right thing to do and other other times you need you need the right people advising you on, you know, like the Rosses of the world, you know, when to apply robotics, when not to apply it. Yeah. You know, somebody like ourselves, when to apply, you know, big data warehouses and big an, an analysis tools and when not. Mm. You know, so. I mean, touching on what John said, really, we've had technology and innovation all our lives, you, you know, whether it's changing from pre-press newspapers to digital, we've always had technology and innovation. I think how we apply it is key. What we're seeing is our client's client wants to know what's going on now. It's not good enough for them to just to fill out a form to say, this room has been cleaned. They want to see how it's been cleaned, when it's been cleaned, who cleaned it, what was used, and they want mm. that at their fingertips. That technology is there. It's not polished enough, but it's mm. getting there. And yeah. I think that's, we just need to be clear and define exactly what people want mm. and make sure there's no blurred lines in between. That brings me to my next point, actually, because how does how does all of this provide genuine value to any business beyond having a clean space? Is it the value for the business for the contractor or the value of the business for the end user? Ultimately, people want to pay less. You know, most yeah. things in life, whether it's the industry that we're in or another industry, it comes to the bottom line. It's still cost-driven. People want to mm. reduce their costs. And in the past, with a paper-based system, you could argue there are ways and means to, to go around to make sure that the, the work has been done. With technology, with sensors, with the ones that John's mentioned, there are no blurred lines. There are There is somebody in that room, they've done the job, you might not be able to tell them yet exactly what products were used, but if they were using a piece of equipment that had telematics in it, that would then feed back to the same dashboard. So you could see the operator was in the room, they've used this machine for five minutes, and then that passes the check, it's audited, and then the end user sees on the dashboard that operator A was in room B for X amount of time. So the value comes down to, in the end, a data-driven model whereby we see more reactional clean as opposed to schedule cleaning. And that's a clear way of reducing your costs to make sure, you know, you've got a 20-floor building and be multi-tenanted, multi-occupancy. You might have several floors that only have 10% occupancy on a Wednesday and a Friday. They don't need to be cleaned. But in the past, that'd be scheduled cleaning. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, you can see why they're doing it. John, there's a, always an automatic assumption with sustainability that it's going to cost more. And there's an assumption with tech-driven solutions that they are going to cost more. So what are the cost implications? Uh, I would say depends who you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like all things. I mean, You're a real you diplomat, know, it, John. It's like, well, no, I think it's the thing around, you know, it's like buying a car. Yeah. You've got your Rolls Royce and you've got, I'm just trying to think, what's the most disparaging <laughs> end of the, wanna, of the market? I'm just so worried about offending <laughs> anybody. <laughs> I'm just like, let's say something at the other end of the market without naming any brands or uh, or models. I think you've just, you've got to do your due diligence. Yeah. And, and I think you've got to find an organisation that you trust trust and you know our approach is, is really simple which is it's what's right for the client and it's what's right for the client's client not what's right for us because mm. you know from a reputational standpoint you only you know from the cleaning side of things you you want to recommend things that you believe in and things that you can justify and with all technology the cost is coming down 
you know, the early adopters always pay the price, you know, a yeah. premium price for it. And I think we certainly the IoT sensors. So, you know, the cost of putting a sensor into a washroom, somewhere like in the order of about 15 to 20 pounds side of things. So, you know, you can get a very accurate reading and a very reliable reading, you know, on ad infinitum you know you yeah. need some infrastructure behind that and you need the analytics behind it but you can throw an enormous sum of money at these sorts of problems or you can pile it and you can do a proof of concept and you can make it much much smaller um side of things and that's that's what we tend to want to do is always that thing about let's just try this and mm. see whether it works dependent upon the client and dependent upon the environment you're trying to map and understand what you could do is you could run your iot setup or your sensors your smart building setup for a month or a couple of months and that would give you enough to set the pattern you know the cleaning pattern for the next two years yeah. or 18 months and potentially see how much you can save yeah, as well off the back absolutely of that. but it's, similarly how far do you want to take it you know you go into a washroom you can have a sensor for the soap you can have a sensor for the paper the hand towel it can um, be like a rabbit beans. warren it can at some be point everything yeah and the, the point being is that if you've got in one washroom 20 sensors mm. and you've got 20 floors and you've got two day janitors and the sensors start going off in different directions, where are they supposed to go? Where's the priority? <laughs> so, you know, there can be sensors for sensors' sake. Yeah. Our approach would definitely be more along the lines of going through footfall detection to understand how many people go into the washroom because you can have 100 people going to the washroom and they treat it with absolute respect. You can have one person go in just after it's been cleaned and trash it. Um, mm. But because those sensors haven't gone off, that might not be seen for the rest of the day. Yet then all the complaints start creeping in. So we need to be careful, again, yeah. you know, not trying to kibosh technology or IoT. It's there for a very good reason. It does a very good job, but it needs to be used sensibly. Yeah. Uh, and by starting small with just a footfall, you can keep your cost quite low. Yeah. And I'll give you a very good example. We got asked a quote for the toilet paper dispensers to monitor them over a very famous street in London, quite a big street. And um, so... We looked at it, we quoted, but what we also asked for at the same time was a report on how many incidents there had been over an 18-month period of people reporting that no toilet roll had actually or toilet paper had been available. And I think over, and this was over something like 120 properties, big properties, and there had been six occasions where people had reported that the cleaners had missed filling up the toilet paper dispensers. And the cost of sticking in sensors and the environmental impact of sticking in sensors and monitoring it and all the other was big. It was really, really big. And we just the price <laughs> the price of not having six people saying, you know, there's yeah. not there's not toilet paper. You know, I'm sure for the six people there was a bit of an issue at the time, you know. <laughs> but actually the cost of actually monitoring that. I can hear all of the toilet uh, paper dispenser people now <laughs> just like burning burning an effigy of me. But um I just I just it's it's back to what Ross said. You've just got to be pragmatic around yeah. what is it you're trying to solve and not try and make problems that really it, genuinely don't it exist. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay, well, John and Ross, really great insights there on technology within the cleaning industry. That's it for this episode. Find more information about the fusion of technology and cleaning and the value it offers wider businesses on the podcast page of our website, jangro.net. And here you can also find out more about Jangro. Keep the conversation going. And remember, technology is making the world a cleaner and smarter place. So keep innovating. Thank you both. See you Thank next you. time. Thank you. Thank you.